And I was just saying to Mark what a difference uh, a day makes in terms of the temperature in this room. I don't know how many of you, of you were in here yesterday, but uh, it was uh, somewhat sauna-like in here. I know as a speaker it was, and uh, I think today you could hang meat in here. It's so uh, so chilly. And this is actually one of the benefits of uh, the real estate crash because we were able to get a, a HVAC um, heating and cooling technician in to add to our air conditioning last evening at about 6 o'clock, actually put in some extra duct work and move some, some of our power source from the third floor down here to the second, and that is something that probably wouldn't have been taking place if the housing boom was in full full throw and uh, they were out building unneeded housing. So one of the benefits of, uh, of, of the bust is you are feeling it right now in much cooler temperatures and I know I, know I appreciate it. Anyway, the bubble economy, uh, speculative bubbles have occurred throughout history. These are episodes that are characterized by continuous sharp rises in prices of a particular asset group uh, or group of related assets leading to further price increases driven by new speculators seeking profits through even higher prices. Uh, these higher prices uh, are driven by the potential trading profits uh, rather than the earning capacity of the economic value of the asset. And these speculative manias then come to very abrupt and dramatic endings as expectations change and builders or buyers quickly become sellers in mass. The ensuing crash inflicts financial pain on the region or the country involved. And in the case of the current meltdown, the whole world is feeling the effects of the crash of the housing boom. Um, the euphoria that we felt a few years ago when our houses were going up in value and our stocks were going up in value. We all felt very rich. Uh, that euphoria turns to uh, despair and it creates massive worker uh, dislocation. In fact, the unemployment rate right now in the United States is 9.5%. Uh, that's nearly double from just a year ago. There's 7.2 million jobs that have been lost uh, since the start of this recession and the average length of unemployment is now 24 and a half weeks. So there's definitely been a cost uh, that has been incurred by, uh, by normal people from uh, this bust in the housing boom. We've also had a, a rash of bankruptcies, uh, many that you've heard about, Circuit City, Tweeter, KB Homes, Sharper Image, Comp USA, Levitt's Furniture, Chrysler, GM, of course, um, and even uh, even a company called Against All Odds uh, appropriately <laughs> has uh, appropriately has gone broke, I guess. So, and even an entire country uh, has gone broke in the form of uh, Iceland. So I urge you to uh, read David Howden's Philip Vegas's work uh, on that uh, bust of that entire uh, country. But uh, it's far from over. This bust. Uh, will go on uh, for, we believe, many years. A number of retailers uh, are expected to, uh, to go under. And that's just the result of uh, a cleansing of uh, this boom that we've had. But there's a lot of uh, school of economics that don't believe that uh, there is such a thing as uh, speculative bubbles. Believe it or not, the Rational Expectation School uh, doesn't believe that there's bubbles at all. In fact, they think that all market participants act rationally and can, tell, and can foretell the future, so bubbles aren't possible. In fact, a couple of uh, uh, rational expectations, uh, professors Flood and Hodrick uh, are quoted as saying, the current empirical tests for bubbles do not successfully establish the case that bubbles exist in asset prices, unquote. Well, I think history would prove otherwise. John Maynard Keynes, uh, he believed that animal spirits caused speculation and therefore bubbles. 
and that uh, evidently we all walk around with these animal spirits, um, and no doubt that's true probably by 7.30 or 8 o'clock out here on the patio, possibly. <laughs> but um, these, uh, uh, these animal spirits lead to speculation and bubbles. In fact, he, he pointed to five factors that uh, foster these episodes. In uh, Chapter 12 of the General Theory, not necessarily that I'm recommending that book, but he does talk about uh, he does talk about speculation. Number one, he says neophyte investors owning an increasing portion of capital investment. Number two, day-to-day -day price fluctuations having an excessive influence over the market. Number three, violent changes in the mass psychology of ignorant individuals changing asset valuations. Number four, professional investors devoting their skills to anticipating what average opinion expects the average opinion to be. So in other words, their investors wouldn't be trying to judge the relative, uh, the relative strengths of an investment. They're just trying to determine what people are going to think uh, that they're going to, uh, or what people are going to invest in. Just get a matter of guessing what uh, popular opinion is going to be, so to speak. And last, confidence or lack of it in the credit markets. Keynes also said in this chapter, quote, nor is it necessary that anyone should keep his simple faith in the conventional basis of valuation having any genuine long-term validity. For it is, so to speak, a game of snap, of old maid, of musical chairs, a pastime in which he is the victor who says snap, neither too soon nor too late, who passes the old maid to his neighbor before the game is over, who secures a chair for himself when the music stops. And as we found out, uh, there's been a number of, of uh, both normal uh, average working people and entrepreneurs who haven't ended up with a chair when the music stopped here in the last couple of years. But ironically, it's, a, it's exactly the results of Keynesian policy that have created uh, the bubble atmosphere that we, that we have. And it's the expansion of the supply of money to increase economic activity that speculative price bubbles and manias are engendered. And this monetary innovation creates malinvestments, as we've learned through Austrian business cycle theory, and uh, those are manifested oftentimes in these speculative bubbles. Of course, what's followed, uh, what's required is the following readjustment period, which is crash, and then the depression or recession uh, that we're living through now. Now, this sequence of events is similar to what uh, Hyman Minsky and uh, uh, Kendall Barger uh, outlined uh, in um, their uh, characterization of uh, stock market booms and busts. And uh, they say that the market rise starts off with some exogenous shocks, such as a war, uh, the end of a war, technological or natural resource discovery, or what I would consider most important, a debt conversion that precipitously lowers interest rates. The shock creates new opportunities for profit and a boom is engendered. Number two, the boom is nurtured by an expansion of bank credit, which expands the money supply. Alternatively, the velocity of, of circulation increases. Or, uh, as we talked about a little bit yesterday, the demand for money would be decreasing. As increased demand pushes up the prices of goods and financial assets, new profit opportunities are found and confidence grows in the economy. A multiplier and accelerator effects into a boom or euphoric state. At this point, overtrading may take place. And this overtrading may involve pure speculation, uh, that is an overemphasis on the acquisition of assets for capital gain rather than from income return. Overestimation of the prospective returns by companies and then excessive gearing is the words they use involve, involving the imposition of low cash requirements on the acquisition of financial assets through buying on margin, by installment purchases, and so on. So I think we saw this in the 
example of this in the latest housing boom, where we had mortgage product that was created uh, with no money down. And in fact, in many cases, uh, potential borrowers didn't even have to really uh, show lenders or prove to lenders that they had any capability of making uh, mortgage payments uh, as long as they could fog a mirror, as I used to like to say, they could get a mortgage loan and not put any money down. So we had uh, millions of people speculating in you know, houses. Uh, Minsky and Kindleberger go on. They say when neophytes attracted by the prospect of large capital gains for small outlay uh, that become numerous in the market, the activity assumes a separate abnormal momentum of its own. Insiders recognize the danger signals and begin to move out of these securities into money. Uh, next, the financial distress period sets in as the neophytes become aware that if there is a rush for liquidity, prices will collapse and the race to move out of securities gathers pace. Revulsion against securities develops as banks start calling in loans and selling collateral. And next, panic sets in as the market collapses and the question arises as to whether the government or the central bank should come in and act as a lender of last resort in what is typically called a lifeboat operation. Now, it's not called lifeboat operation anymore. It's just called a bailout. And we've seen plenty of bailouts of large Wall Street firms, and uh, we will see more uh, in all likelihood going forward. But uh, financial bumble bubbles are not a modern phenomenon by any stretch. They've been going on for years. And the first one that I'd like to talk about is actually the first Keynesian uh, there ever was. And he actually was 200 years before Keynesian himself was even born. And this guy named John Law. And John Law was uh, uh, perhaps uh, more than just an economist. He, he exercised more power than any other uncrowned uh, individual in Europe. The height of his power, he controlled the Royal Bank, thus the supply of money, public debt, indirect taxes, colonial trade, the tobacco monopoly, and more than half of what is now considered uh, now the continental United States. Additionally, Law was the finance minister. He was the main economic advisor and a favorite of an absolute prince. And Law was uh, thus the, the first to give Keynesian economics its first, uh, its first tress, uh, tr a test. It would be uh, similar to, say, Paul Krugman being chairman of the Fed, uh, controlling the Treasury, being the president, uh, head of the IRS. It just goes on and on, if you can imagine what that would be like. This is the power that... <laughs> The, the, that's the power that um, John Law had. But he's much more dashing character than uh, any of those gentlemen that I mentioned. Law's father was a goldsmith banker uh, in Scotland, and uh, he died when Law was a teenager. Uh, Law worked for his father as a uh, goldsmith banker, uh, learning the uh, Scottish banking trade. He had a great aptitude for numbers. So he was a quick study, could have t easily taken over the business. But when his father passed away, um, John Law, uh, like any sensible young man, devoted his interest to women and gambling. So uh, with the inheritance that he, he took from his father, he took off for London and uh, pursued gambling and women. Law eventually, of course, went broke gambling lost all of his inheritance, racked up a bunch of debt. So he had to ask his mother to sell a family estate that he had inherited to bail him out. And she bought the estate for, um, for her son and kept, kept John Law from going to debtor's prison. Now back in those days, uh, they, they did have debtor's prison. And if you can imagine, if we had debtor's prisons today, um, with uh, the amount of indebtedness that's out there between consumers and companies, I dare say there wouldn't be uh, enough space in the prison system to uh, put people away in debtor's prison. But uh, uh, his mother was able to keep him out of, of debtor's prison, so he, uh, he turned a new leaf in his, uh, in his gambling 
And I think it was because he hated to go for his mother uh, for help. And I hopefully you all feel that way, that you never want to go to your mothers for help. But he trained himself to be a skilled gambler, and his wins were, uh, from that point on, really not out of luck, but out of, uh, of wiliness. His uh, large gains were made when he adopted the role of the banker instead of uh, the player. So he only gambled. And he really didn't gamble. He was the banker when the odds were stacked heavily in his favor. And that's how he made uh, made his money. He was very uh, suave, debonair. He was a womanizing gambler. He always seemed to come out on top. He had plenty of friends in high places. And uh, he worked the party circuit throughout Europe all the time, uh, having a somewhat of a skeleton in his closet in the form of Edward Wilson, who he killed in a duel. Uh, back in London, and uh, the details of that duel are, are kind of sketchy. Uh, it's unknown for sure why they were dueling, uh, but it is for sure known that uh, John Law did kill him. Uh, but uh, they don't know if he was, uh, they were dueling over Elizabeth Villiers, who happened to be the king's boss-eyed, unattractive mistress, as she was known, or a certain, a certain miss. Mrs. Lawrence, who was John Law's paramour, or money that uh, Edwin Millison may have owed Law uh, through some other transaction. It's really unknown. But uh, Law was unable to get a pardon for the murder of Wilson, so he gambled his way across Europe for 14 years, supporting himself with gambling wins. It's a pretty decent way to make a living, I suppose. And uh, But he wasn't just a gambler and a philanderer. He thought about uh, mathematical and financial conundrums. And he had plans to uh, implement a banking system. And he pitched these to various governments throughout uh, Europe during these years. And the first uh, such case was in France in 1702. He went to the headmistress of Louis XIV, but he was turned down. Some believe because law was a Protestant rather than a Catholic. Now, it seems probably curious to us that he would go to the head mistress of Louis XIV to try to get this plan. I mean, essentially like, like going to Monica Lewinsky when Bill Clinton was president, I suppose, to uh, try to get uh, legislation passed. But uh, that's the way it was done in those days. It's rather charming, I think. But uh, those were the, the days. He made a land bank proposal to the Scottish Parliament in 1705, but again, he was rejected. 1706, he submitted a similar proposal to the French uh, finance minister, but he, not only was he told no, he was told to get out of the country. Next law presented the bank proposal to the Duke of Savoy in 1711, but the Duke thought it was too ambitious for a small country and suggested law try France again, which he did. However, he was turned down again, 1715, but he got a big break. Louis XIV died that same year, and the immediate heir to the throne was only seven years old. And that left Law's old drinking and carousing buddy, the Duke of Orleans, in charge. And since Law had friends in high places that he had... Uh, that he had fostered in the party circuit, so to speak, he had an opportunity to implement his system. And in 1715, France was really in bad shape. It was in a depression, government was nearly bankrupt, and the regent had tried such, such tactics as recoinage, had depreciated the currency by 20%, uh, aggressive, heavy taxation, uh, all of these tactics didn't work, and the uh, the populace was a, a tad annoyed with it. So when Law showed up, he said the only thing France needed to do was create more money. Haven't we heard that before in that sense? So if there was a shortage of gold and silver, quote, the answer was to establish a national bank and issue money made of paper. And his plan was uh, quite well received. They were very happy. Uh, to uh, implement Law's plan. Now, Law and Orleans, they were, they were two peas in a pod, so to speak. They were both very athletic. They were handsome. They were brilliant tennis players. And according to at least uh, uh, one biographer, both enjoyed extraordinary success with the opposite sex. 
so that he had a, a lifelong friend, uh, Law did, in, uh, in uh, Orleans. Law started small with the Bank General in uh, May of 1716. In the beginning, banknotes were to be payable in specie of the weight and standard of the date. The bank was uh, not subject to taxation, nor were foreigners' deposits subject to confiscation in the case of war. However, there was no limit placed on the number of banknotes that could be issued by the bank. This was left to John Law's judgment as to the amount of banknotes in circulation. That is a very important point that you should keep in mind as the story progresses. Initially, Bank General was uh, prudently operated. And, uh, um, and, of course, within a year, Law received help from Orleans in helping the bank by requiring tax collections to remit, uh, remit payments to the Treasury and Law's banknotes. There was great opposition to this, and it actually took three additional degrees before the Providence's uh, succumbed, but eventually uh, uh, all tax collections uh, were made in Law's banknotes, and, and obviously that, uh, that helped the bank's business. But Law had enemies, and they tested him early, and in fact uh, there were a group of, group of investors who didn't like Law, and they, uh, they had accumulated five, uh, five million uh, livers in notes, and um, they had, uh, they essentially went to the bank and demanded silver uh, for those notes. Law couldn't satisfy this bank run on the spot, but he uh, promised to pay the day later. And he went to the finance minister uh, for help, uh, essentially a bailout. And as much as the finance minister didn't like Law because he had this cozy relationship with the Duke of Orleans, uh, the finance minister felt like he had to bail him out and provide the silver to satisfy the redemption. Uh, similar to uh, Ben Bernanke and, and uh, Secretary Paulson last fall when they, the last thing they wanted to do was bail out the banking system, but they just had to. And so uh, this started very early um, back in the 1700s. Law next started the Company of the West in 1717, he sold shares, and what he did with these shares was that he converted government debt into his company stock at a lower interest rate. So what he was able to do for, for the king was to refinance, uh, refinance the debt so that it uh, uh, lowered the uh, amount of interest the government paid. The government turned around and reciprocated by giving him the trading privilege with Louisiana. Law, at that point, uh, when he got this trading privilege, he disseminated all kinds of propaganda, uh, extolling the riches in Louisiana. Supposedly there was veins of gold that were, you know, a foot thick. Uh, the land was very fertile. There was just all this wonderful, uh, wonderful propaganda he put out. Uh, essentially to sell shares, but uh, it turns out that Bernard Canelon, who, uh, who was the brother of Richard Canelon, uh, su supervised the prospecting party to, uh, that sailed to Louisiana. In fact, he didn't even find any treasure and instead found disease and hostile natives. So everything that, uh, everything that Law was saying was, uh, as I said, pure propaganda. December of 1718, Bank General uh, became Royal Bank. In other words, it was uh, controlled by the government at that point. Uh, law, it took a couple years before Law got that done, but uh, he finally did at that point. Uh, the Company of the West shares were, were languishing. So Law merged the Company of East Indies and the China Company together with the Company of the West and formed a new company called the Company of the Indies, but it was commonly called the Mississippi Company. So when you hear about this episode, it is known as the Mississippi Bubble, and uh, it is because of that company, the Mississippi Company. Law issued even more shares to buy these companies as well as the Company of Africa. Now, Parliament initially refused to approve the stock issue, but good old Duke of Orleans stepped in and unilaterally granted approval uh, by decree. So law was able to issue these shares. Now, by this time, the stock was selling for uh, 650 levers, uh, uh, as opposed to the issue price of 500. So it had risen uh, somewhat. 
And this was undoubtedly uh, supported by a, a huge bank issue of 169 million uh, liveries in uh, banknotes issued by the Royal Bank. So what we have is we have law issuing shares in the Mississippi Company on one side, and through the Royal and banknotes uh, through his Royal Bank uh, on the other. The other thing that he did was he allowed people to put, uh, purchase shares in the Mississippi Company in 20 monthly installments. So just like when we see low uh, money down loans for houses, or we see being able to buy stocks on on margin. Uh, where you can borrow uh, quite a bit of it. In this case, he was able to hype the stock by uh, allowing people to uh, buy the stock in 20 monthly installments. So you could get in on the action for very little money down. Now, the new Mississippi uh, shares could only be purchased by owners of the old Mississippi shares. It was like a rights offering. And uh, so people scrambled to uh, uh, be able to... Uh, uh, essentially buy more shares uh, uh, of, of stock that they already uh, have, they already had. Share price soon went to uh, to a thousand by July of nineteen or of seventeen nineteen, and the Mississippi Company was then awarded the profits of the mint for a nine year period, which they've paid fifty um, million uh, liveries for. On July twenty fifth, Royal Bank issued banknotes in the amount of. 21 million worth of liveries. So the Royal Bank is doing their part by uh, stomping on the uh, monetary gas, if you will, pumping up the amount of notes, and uh, uh, and this allowed plenty of money to be floated around to be invested in uh, Mississippi Company shares. Law then announced a 60 uh, livery div uh, dividend for the shares. And then after announcing the dividend, he turned around and floated new rights issue to hopefully raise another 50 million livres uh, to pay for the mint, mint purchase. So uh, law worked in concert where he would have the Royal Bank uh, create notes, and then he would issue shares to adv uh, take advantage of, of higher prices. Law priced the new issue now at 1,000 livres each. So we've gone from 500 650, now we're at 1,000, and again, that was a rights offering. You had to own four of the original shares, one of the secondary offering, in order to purchase one share of the new offering, which you could pay in 20 monthly installments of 50 livres each. But he did create a sense of urgency in that he only allowed 20 days for people to subscribe, so uh, people couldn't, uh, couldn't think about this too long. They needed to jump right on it. And indeed they did. The price went uh, on July 25th, 1719 to 1300. By uh, the 29th, it was a 1500. By the 1st, 22, uh, 225. By the 9th, 2330. And by September, the shares were going for 5,000 liveries each. So they were up 10 times uh, what the issue, uh, original issue was. Law then made four uh, share issues and a total of 324,000 shares at 5,000 livres each, payable in 10 monthly installments of 5,000 livres. So again, he took the opportunity with the increased uh, stock price to issue yet more shares. And these, uh, these new issues were to raise a billion five livres, an amount 14 times greater than the total of Law's first three stock issues combined. Of course, the Royal Bank was there to support people. They had low interest loans available for share prices, and uh, the shares were bearer securities, so people could buy them anonymously and hold them. So there was a tremendous uh, demand at this point for uh, these shares. But the primary fuel uh, was the increase in the bank notes. By the, uh, by the end of 1719, the total uh, uh, banknotes outstanding was uh, one billion uh, livres. Now near the end uh, again of the year in 1719, the share prices had risen to 10,000 livres. So we had a jump from September now, it's doubled again to 10,000 at the end of the year. In fact, the peak price of these shares was 10,100 uh, on January 8, 1720. 
By that time, people were looking to get out. And they were looking to not get out into just the crummy banknotes, but they wanted to get out into silver. But Law wanted to do everything he could to keep people from doing that, so he declared another dividend, 200 uh, livre dividend, uh, on uh, the last day of the year, 1719. Uh, there was no way that the company could cover such a dividend, but uh, it was f uh, useful just to, uh, to hype the stock. Also at the time, Law was appointed Controller General of France, so he took on another political uh, appointment during the, uh, during the top of the market, essentially, at this point. Uh, he tried to convince anybody he could to stay in the shares, uh, especially important investors like Richard Canelon. Um, uh, reportedly, they were good friends, Canelon and Law, uh, shared many nights uh, and many bottles of wine, and it was over uh, m multiple bottles of wine that Law tried to uh, convince Canelon to stay in his shares, but to no avail. Canelon wanted to uh, bail out. Primarily for the fact that he, he realized that the, the increase in the share price were mainly due to the smoke and mirrors and just increasing quantities of paper money. Also, remember his brother Bernard had actually gone to Louisiana and said there was nothing there uh, except disease and uh, hostile natives. So, uh, so Canelon knew that the, the jig was up and it was time for him to uh, get out of there. Law at that point resorted to uh, despotic power. He uh, banned the export of coins and bullion. He prohibited the purchase of uh, diamonds and other jewelry. Uh, when that didn't stop the exit from paper, Law outlawed the production and sale of all gold and silver artifacts, with the exception of religious paraphernalia. Within a, uh, a month, Law banned the possession of more than 500 livres worth of silver or gold. It required all payments of more than 100 livres to be made in banknotes. Uh, people were promised generous rewards if they informed on their neighbors. So if your neighbor thought that you had silver and gold in your house, uh, concealed illegally, then uh, people were turning in their neighbors, servants were turning in their masters, and there was a door-to-door -door search for people's gold and silver. So uh, just like Canlon, many people were running for the cover of uh, silver. Vendors were not interested in taking paper anymore at this time. They uh, only wanted to accept silver and gold. Price inflation, as you can imagine, was rampant. Prices were rising 25% in just two months. Uh, and in the case of bread, uh, Prices soared uh, 300 to 400 percent. At that point, uh, in February of 1720, the Royal Bank was absorbed into the Mississippi Company, and, and they started running the printing presses, uh, creating notes full time. But the printers and the clerks couldn't keep up. Uh, engraved notes uh, were abandoned, and more clerks were uh, designated to sign notes. And in fact, some of the uh, Lower denomination notes weren't, uh, were issued without signature at all. So similar to the case of Zimbabwe uh, that we have currently where they can't keep up with just creating enough paper. Um, and of course, the, uh, the Treasury is creating money uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days here in America with similar case in, uh, in France in 1720. At that point, the king wanted to get out. The king wanted to uh, cash out his shares, and uh, so they made a deal at 900 livres, which was close to the close to the top of the market. They made a deal to pay him out, but uh, unfortunately for everybody else, they didn't uh, do those uh, do them any favors, and uh, the price of of shares began to fall. All uh, bank loans uh, were being called at maturity. As you can imagine, all of the Royal Bank's uh, uh, loans were essentially uh, secured by Mississippi Company stock. So when the, uh, when the price of the stock went down, uh, triggered margin calls, and, uh, and the bank was thus uh, calling loans. Uh, by May 21st of 1720, the uh, bank note supply was up to 2.1 
billion uh, livres, and if you remember, uh, that's just five months ago. It was at one billion. So they doubled the money supply uh, in a period of five months. Uh, all the time, they only had 21 million livres in silver, 28 million livres in gold. So they held at that point about two percent. Uh, in uh, specie backing all these banknotes. Uh, law at that point issued a series of uh, uh, decrees that uh, really was his, his undoing. Uh, he had a systematic plan to lower the price of Mississippi Company shares. He had a systematic plan to lower the price of, uh, or of, of silver. Uh, he was going to lower the price from 8000 to 5000 by December of the shares, and silver would be devalued from 65 levers to 30 by December 1st. Of course, you can imagine the public was outraged by this, and uh, they forced the regent to put uh, the uh, formerly very uh, high esteem uh, law under house arrest and uh, eventually had to leave the country. Uh, the share prices fell eventually to 3300 by November. Uh, again, it was very gradual because you didn't really have much of a choice. Uh, it was against the law to hold really any gold or silver uh, or diamonds or anything else. And so the, the, the only choice was either shares or banknotes. And so uh, it was a very gradual drop in the price. However, when we look at the price of the Mississippi Company shares in pounds sterling, they fell from 302 uh, pounds down to 47. So not quite a 90% fall, uh, but pretty close to that. And it was after John Law's Mississippi bubble burst that losses were so heavy and the, su the uh, suffering was so immense that for over 100 years, it was even considered a faux pas in France to utter the word bank, a term which for a time was synonymous with fraud. And uh, as much as bankers are uh, under pressure now, it's possible that uh, we could return to that again, which probably wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Now, switching to a modern version of the uh, uh, bubble, I uh, wanted to talk about uh, the United States and the Federal Reserve. Since the beginning of the Federal Reserve, especially since the last ties of the gold standard were cut in August of 71, uh, the economy has been one long series of bubbles, whether it be stocks, bonds, residential real estate, commercial real estate, commodities. We've had bubbles in all of those things. It's been one, uh, one long series, uh, one continuous series of one bubble after another. And uh, when we look at money supply growth uh, in terms of M2, it's grown from $683 billion in August of 71 when uh, Nixon cut the uh, last ties to the gold standard. And it's grown over 12 times that amount to $8.3 trillion in May of 2009. So we've had tremendous monetary growth, and, uh, and thus this increase in money has led to one bubble after the next. In terms of interest rates, uh, the Fed funds rate, uh, which is the, the rate that the... Uh, Federal Reserve controls uh, in May of 2000, it was 6.5%. It was lowered to 1%. Uh, of course, that was done gradually by June uh, 25th of 2003. Again, that was a result of 9-11. Uh, and uh, it was kept there for a year at a very low 1%. And before, uh, being, before rising by a quarter in uh, June of 2004, ultimately Fed funds was raised to five and a quarter, 2006, and since then rates, uh, as I'm sure you've been uh, are aware, have been slashed to a mere quarter of a percent. Again, uh, with the hope to stimulate the economy, similar to how uh, John Law was hoping to stimulate the French economy by creating uh, money out of nowhere uh, in France. Hasn't necessarily worked, uh, didn't work for John Law, hasn't worked uh, in uh, the United States. But I want to talk about one bubble. We've all heard about the high, uh, the um, housing bubble here in the United States and, uh, of course, the dot-com bubble for stocks. But uh, 
being from Las Vegas, uh, we had a little bubble in land prices during this period. And uh, I think it's instructive of, uh, of what can happen uh, to a, an asset uh, when you have low interest rates, you have housing, uh, but houses, uh, to build houses, you need land. And, uh, and uh, in the case of Las Vegas, most of the land surrounding Las Vegas is owned by the federal government. Most people don't realize that. If you fly into Vegas, you see all this land, and you would think uh, Las Vegas has land as, as far as the eye can see that could be developed on. But the Bureau of Land Management, the federal government, owns 90% of the land in Clark County, Nevada. But uh, to, to help growth along, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, through congressional action, uh, was able to begin auctioning land uh, in the early part of this decade. And uh, those auctions uh, started really in earnest in May of 2001, and the Bureau of Land Management had a land auction of a 1,900-acre parcel that was sold for $42.7 million, or $26,672 per acre. Doesn't sound like much. Turned out it really wasn't much. But at the time, the winning bidder was criticized for having paid too much. The next year, November 2002, again, 9-11 uh, has occurred since. There was a brief period where Las Vegas uh, lost a uh, number of travelers. A lot of conventions pulled out. Um, but the market very quickly rebounded. Uh, the Federal Reserve was lowering, lowering interest rates and uh, the tremendous uh, boom in housing. So on November 2nd, they had an auction and the average price paid per acre rose to $159,944 per acre. So again, we've gone from 26672 per acre and uh, Oh, about 18 months later, it's risen to 159,944 per acre. In April 2003, the median price of a home had hit 200,000, and that's a doubling uh, in just 14 months. So you can see the price of the house is doubling, and you can see that the price of the land is going up roughly five-fold. June 5, 2003, the Bureau of Land Management has another land auction. The average price this time was $233,000 per acre. They auctioned 995 acres with the government receiving $232 million. And it was about this time that George Bush began to uh, take an interest in these uh, auctions. In fact, he uh, was trying to make a pitch to have the proceeds uh, go into the general treasurer to uh, help fight the uh, war on terror. 2004, the, marking, uh, the housing market in Las Vegas was so hot, there was only 2,500 homes on the multiple listing service. And uh, for a town that was approaching 2 million to only have 2,500, uh, that is, uh, there was very few homes available for, for sale. Uh, the unemployment rate was only 3.5%. Um, the town was just... Uh, Red hot. In fact, the, the best story I heard from people who could not buy a home, uh, they could not get any of their bids accepted for a house. So one couple went to Home Depot on a Saturday morning and they hung around the sign section and waited for someone to go buy a sign for sale by owner. And when the first person showed up to pick one of those signs off to buy it, the couple swooped in on them and said, are you selling your home? And they said, yes. We said, we'll follow you to your house and buy it. So that's how, that's how hot the market was uh, back, into, uh, back in 2004. There was also a BLM auction, of course, that year. And by this time, originally the BLM auctions, they would have them in their offices. A few people would show up. Uh, certainly no more than, than are in this room right now. Uh, and you'd have a few people bidding and that would be it. But by 2004, they had to move 
They had to continually move these auctions to bigger venues. And in fact, I think in a couple of cases, they started serving drinks beforehand, uh, which always uh, helps uh, lubricate the uh, activities, so to speak, even though they start these auctions at 10 a.m. It's no big deal in Vegas for people to begin drinking that early. <laughs> so uh, the BLM auction was attended by 2,000 people and included 40, 460 bidders. In fact, I remember sitting by uh, uh, couples uh, at these auctions, and I'd ask them if they if they were going to bid, and they said, "Oh yes, they had a bidding card, and and they uh, they had <laughs> they had identified a small piece of property, and they would thought that they were going to to bid on it and get a great uh, bargain." Because you had to recognize that the BLM auctions didn't start at zero; they started at the appraised value. So the BLM would go and have all these parcels appraised, and that's what they would start at. So you had to at least pay appraised value. But in, the, in uh, most cases, uh, well, in all cases during the boom, there's no way you would uh, be able to buy it for that. In fact, in this 2004 auction of the acreage, uh, the total acreage was appraised for 300 Roughly 310 million was the appraised value. The total proceeds from the sale were 707 million dollars. So the, the prices they received in the auction were more than double what the appraised value were. This was in 2000 and 2004. And then in 2005, the market was still red hot. As I mentioned, it was hard to find a home. So the housing product that uh, took hold was uh, uh, condo conversions. I don't know if you've ever heard of a condo conversion, but that's where a developer will buy an apartment project and uh, map the individual units and then sell these crummy apartments uh, as, as homes. And in this case, they may paint them and they may re-carpet them, uh, put some new linoleum on, a, on the floors, but uh, we had the opportunity to uh, visit uh, one of these projects uh, the day before they went on sale. And uh, these units were about 1,000 square feet. And they wanted to sell them for 100, they were selling them for 184,000, which is 180, 184 bucks a square foot. And these were units um, that were rented for 800 bucks a square foot. And so, uh, you, if you were going to buy this as an investment, you'd pay 184,005. You could expect 800 bucks in in uh, a month in rent. However, the homeowners association dues were 150 dollars a month, and the community dues were 69 dollars a month. So you would have to subtract those two numbers from your 800 to get your yield on the 184. Thousand bucks that you would be paying. Of course, if you were paying cash, that's about a 3.8 percent return, and at the time, Treasury notes were paying higher than that. So it didn't seem like a good investment to me, as we were walking around. But uh, we uh, we went and had dinner afterwards um, at a nice fresh uh, French restaurant, and uh, the uh, a, a mortgage broker and and a uh, fellow condo tour taker accompanied us to dinner, and uh, he called uh, these units no-brainers. We had to buy these things. He said these things will be $300,000 units in five years. And I said, gee, I mean, at 184 bucks a square foot, this seems kind of rich. And which he said, gee, people freak out about 200 square foot. These will be 300 square foot in a couple of years, maybe 500 a square foot. And uh, I was wondering, well, how do you know that? And he says, oh, I'm from Southern California. I've seen this happen before. So you should just buy it and don't worry about it. And um, I said, well, the rents won't even cover the mortgage payment. If you put debt on these, you won't get enough from the rent to, to even make the payment. He says, oh, no way. Don't worry about it. He says, I'd take out a negative amortization interest-only loan that you would only pay 1.75% on for the first five years. And then, of course, it would reset. After five years, who cares what the payment will be? You'll be cashed out, he said. This was in 2005, so uh, <laughs> theoretically, 
theoretically we would be cashed out uh, sometime between, say, now and uh, 2010. And, uh, of course, at paying 175, you know what happens in a, ne a negative amortization loan. You add to the principal the amount that uh, you're not paying in interest. If you're only paying 175 and the real rate is 5, then you're adding 3.25% to your, your principal balance every month. But he said, hey, this is no big deal. Values go up 8% a year minimum. That's what he said in real estate. And I said something to, something to the, the effect that I thought real estate values were already inflated. And, uh, gee, the, these, these un units may not even go up in value. They may even go down. And, of course, he said that's impossible. There's maybe a 1% chance that that would happen. <laughs> And so I asked him, I said, well, what if they don't go up at all? Uh, how much could we lose? And he says, oh, I don't know. You might lose 10%. Well, um, last year in Las Vegas, uh, the price of, median price of condo conversions went down 56%. And the previous year, they had gone down uh, before that. So those $184,000 units uh, today are probably selling between 50 and sixty thousand dollars, if you could get a bid on them at all. But that was at the height of the boom. There were nearly four hundred, uh, or nearly forty thousand new homes sold in Vegas that year, uh, in two thousand five, which was a record. And in fact, in the fall of two thousand five, the BLM had an auction where they sold three thousand acres for just under eight hundred million dollars, or two hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars an acre. It was in 2005. And then early in the following year, in 2006, median price of a home hit $350,000. So as you remember, um, it was just a couple of months, a uh, couple years previous where the median price had hit 200, and of course it had been 14 months before that, where it had only been 100,000 for a median home. So the price of price of homes had gone up about three times in Vegas, but in the case of land, it had gone up uh, about ten times. Well, then we hit uh, March of 2000, uh, or October of, of 2006. Uh, the median price was still high, but at that point there were 20,000 homes on the multiple listing service. You remember a few years earlier, there had only been 2,500. There was only one BLM auction that year in 2006, and as the market changed, well, auctions change. And they only were able to sell 22 and a half acres for $9 million. March 2007, they had another auction. Only 100 people showed up. Very few bidders. Only 25 acres was auctioned for $12.5 million. But, of course, people in Vegas... Um, Hope springs eternal. It's what Vegas is all about. And uh, the strip was still full of high-rise cranes. We had 49 million or 49 billion dollars worth of projects that had been announced, and so there, the prospects of a turnaround were right around the, the corner. Fortunately, in 2007, fewer than 20,000 new homes were sold. That's uh, less than half the number that had been closed in 2005. So bringing you up to date now in Las Vegas, the Echelon Project, uh, which is a huge uh, $4 billion uh, hotel project that everybody was counting on, they got the steel erected and they stopped. They have gone no further. Fountain Blue, uh, that project has been stopped and uh, they have filed for bankruptcy. Cosmopolitan has been stopped taken over by the lender in foreclosure. Many other projects never got started. Donald Trump built some condos. He was only able to close 20% of those sales. And the buyers of the soon-to-be-completed city center project, the largest private uh, project uh, in the United States, uh, those buyers either want their deposits back or they want their prices lowered. Otherwise, you're going to see multiple lawsuits out of that uh, project. And of course now there's 21,181 homes on the MLS and uh, unfortunately I'm very familiar with one of those homes. 
on the MLS. The median price of a new home has fallen to $212,000. The price of a used home has fallen, a median used home in Las Vegas has fallen to $120,000. Builders are going to close less than 400 new homes a month this year or less than 5,000 for the year. So if you remember in the boom, uh, builders closed 40,000 homes in a year and this year it's going to be 5,000. Las Vegas is the epicenter for foreclosures. One in every 13 homes in Las Vegas is in foreclosure right now. And in terms of the value of the lots, single family lots that you have to build those homes on, they've fallen 72%, which means if you had a $100,000 lot, it's now worth 28,000. That is less than the cost to do those improvements. The water fee uh, for sewer hookup is 7,000 and the other engineering and the, uh, the, uh, the other cost to uh, create a lot generally make a lot uh, 30 to 35,000 to create. Those lots are maybe worth 28,000. In fact, I talked to one of my old customers recently and he said if you wanted to make uh, a profit on homes in some parts of Las Vegas, you could not pay anything for the lots or the land. So much of that land that was bought in those auctions a few years ago, um, some of it is worth something. Some of it is probably worth nothing at this point. And in fact, just in the month of June, lenders started foreclosure on over 300 million in land loans in Las Vegas. That is just in one month. So uh, you can see that uh, this recession, or depression, whatever you call it, is the recovery phase that weeds out the inefficient, uh, the unprofitable businesses, and of course it uh, liquidates uh, the speculation that happens in a money-induced boom that we've had in the last few years. But unfortunately, the government central banks are doing all it can to reinflate the bubble, letting instead of letting uh, bad investments and uh, bubbles be popped and liquidated, uh, they are doing all they can to, to reinflate. And Ludwig von Mises foresaw this. He said, if the crisis were ruthlessly permitted to run its course, bring about the destruction of enterprises which were unable to meet their obligations, then all entrepreneurs, not only banks, but also businessmen, would exhibit more caution in granting and using credit in the future. Instead, public opinion approves of giving assistance in the crisis. Then, no sooner is the worst over, than the banks are spurred on to a new expansion of circulated credit. And that's where we are today. And that's the bad news. But the good news is, it's time for dinner. So thank you. <laughs>